Welcome back, folks. Um, I want to talk about a very important subject if you own a first or second generation Mazda Miata specifically. Now, this also applies to other makes and models, but um, we're really talking about anything built throughout the 90s into the early 2000s and even before, uh, back into the 80s. I previously put up a video titled The Ticking Time Bombs Lurking Within Your your Vintage Cars EC, or something to that effect. And um, I promised I'd follow up with a how-to on how to fix this. But in the meantime, while I've been waiting for parts to arrive, I've been lurking on a couple of Miata forums, and it's quite entertaining because here's a, here's a, a made-up but very realistic example of, a, of, a, of an amalgamation of different threads I've read. Um... I've got a 94 Miata, it it suddenly stalls when hot, or it won't start when hot, or it it idles funny when it's when it's hot, and then it suddenly springs back to life, and I've I've replaced every sensor, I've replaced all the injectors, I've replaced the wiring harness, I replaced the windshield, and it still doesn't run right. What do I do? And I, I just have to chuckle because this problem is so unheard of. It's not unheard of, but it's it's not talked about enough in in, in vintage um, automobile collector uh, circles. It's just not discussed because car guys and gals are not necessarily electronics guys and gals. Let me explain what I mean by that. ASE certified mechanic, okay, following everything by the book, will never find this problem. They will never diagnose this because they're not trained to open up an ECU and check for leaking electrolytic capacitors. It's just not in the book. It's not in the service manual. And if you ask any mechanic who is not as... Um, explorative as some of us hobbyists are they're like i don't know just replace the ecu right just replace it it's a hundred bucks at the at the scrapyard you can get a get an ecu for a hundred bucks at the scrapyard just put it in so you do that and it still does it or maybe it doesn't do it immediately but it will develop the problem later on because they're all built with the same parts with the same materials with the same Techniques, same blueprints. The problem is the ECU isn't bad. It's the power delivery going into the ECU because the ECU has its own power filtering and uh, regulation section right over here. The problem are these three little caps. These are capacitors. There's three different values. Now, I'll put the details in the description of this video, and I'll actually show you where you can get the parts. Um, but here's the thing, and this is why it has to be done before it fails. If you've got a first or second generation Miata, or any car from that vent, from that era, Honda, Toyota, Mitsubishi, Ford, Chevy, whatever, you should be looking for this problem before, before it causes any issues. Take a look at this board. Do you see all this black stuff here? That is damage. That is corrosion caused by electrolyte leaking from this capacitor. Electrolyte is a conductive and caustic uh, fluid that each capacitor is filled with. It basically turns these into these like little batteries, to simplify it. They act like little batteries. They can store a charge for a short period of time and a very powerful one at that. But as they get older, they begin to leak. And when they leak, they leak a conductive fluid all over the board, and it shorts things out. This is as bad as it sounds. Now, the problem is, there's no one symptom that can be uh, pinpointed. There's no one thing that, like, oh, oh, the car is doing that? Well, that's the problem. It can be a variety of symptoms. Now, my car, this is the ECU for my 1994 uh, Mazda Miata with only 70-odd thousand miles on it. And it has a problem where it runs fine, starts up cold, 
dries great, no issues, no hesitation, no misfiring. But when it's hot and you shut it down, you go to restart it, and it starts to hesitate for about a second or two, maybe two seconds, maybe three seconds. And then all of a sudden, without any input, you don't do anything. All of a sudden, boom, it runs fine. This is what I found. Now, these guys right here, this is what the part looks like. These are EMI filters. Now, they're used in a... I don't know what they're used for in this application particularly, but their job is to filter power and remove interference. It composed, it's composed of, a, of a, um, a ceramic capacitor and I believe it two, looks like there's two chokes in there. And this one's blown apart. It's not supposed to be like that. This capacitor here is actively leaking electrolyte downward on the board, shorting these pins out over here, causing this to get hot enough to blow apart. And in this case, in some cases, I, I've heard of them actually burning holes in the board. All of this can be prevented for about 15 bucks worth of parts. Or you can go to the junkyard and buy another ECU while you still can, because there will be a time when you can't, and you're going to have the same problem. Now, obviously, if you're a tuner, if you're, if you're an enthusiast, a racer, an enthusiast, whatever, you can buy an ECU for your car that is brand new. You can buy a brand new racing or tuning ECU that is designed for modification and performance and all that. But those don't come cheap. They're about a thousand bucks. And why? If, if you're, <laughs> I, I get there's a case for that. Or you could just spend 15 bucks and do exactly what I do in this video and you can save your ECU and save yourself a lot of headaches. Anytime you have an issue where your car is misfiring or if there's um, stalling issues, whether hot or cold, no matter what, and you've got a 30-year-old Miata sitting in your garage, the first thing you should do, the very first thing you should do is pull back the carpet behind the passenger seat, undo the four screws for the cover, take a flashlight and look in this region here by the connector. It's going to be sitting like this in the car. That's what you're going to be looking at. And you're going to be looking in this region right here. Look for any discoloration. Look for any corrosion, any burn marks, anything like that. Once you do... Whether you find the problem or not, you should do what I do in this video, and we're going to replace these components, and we're going to fix that board so that it works again, and we're going to prevent further damage. Because these cars are all built with the same parts. Now, this is now let me talk about this too for a sec here. This is not a defect. This is not a design flaw. This is um, simply the components that were chosen for this application, which are totally fine, electrolytic capacitors are the norm. That's what they use when they build any, really any electronic device because they're cheap. They're very inexpensive and they do last a long time. The problem is these cars were never meant to last more than 10 years, if that. So when they were designing these components or these, these ECUs and what have you, they weren't designing them to last 75 years, okay? So we're, we're, we're doing repairs that were never intended to be done in the first place because the life of, it, of, a, of a capacitor can go up to 30 years, okay? Now let's get on with it. So, yeah, I had a couple of, well, one particular gentleman in a forum who argued with me that this isn't a problem, and his mechanic would have told him if it was. And Look, I work on electronics, you work on cars. I actually work on both. Not as a profession, but as a hobbyist, I work on cars and electronics. So I, I kind of get why this disconnect exists in the community. But um, because the two communities don't... The electronics people and the car people don't always come together and say, hey, there's an electronic issue causing your problem that you can fix for like 10 bucks. It's just not happening. So that's what this video is about.
Sorry to bore you guys with the details, but... All right, here's what we need to do. Here's what you need to fix this problem. You're going to need to get yourself some solder um, braid or desoldering braid. I use NTE. Um, this is uh, what you call rosin impregnated. Um, it has flux kind of built into it, so it wicks up solder very nicely. You're going to need this. You're going to need a roll of... Um, Actually, I prefer 6040, which is, um, it contains lead. You can buy this. I bought this today at Ace Hardware. Uh, this is 6040 solder. Um, if it really matters, uh, it's, it's, uh, doesn't show me what the diameter is, but. Electronics grade 6040 solder. You're going to need some of that. Okay. all prepped here so I can use it. You're going to need a soldering iron. Now I use, because I do a lot of this stuff, I use a Hacko FX888D soldering station. It's a digital soldering station. Um, very well regulated. Um, I use it for all of my radio repair work. I do a lot of Miata radio repairs here. That's what I do. And um, it is the greatest soldering iron I've ever owned. I've been soldering since I was about nine years old, and this is the best one I've ever had, and I love this thing. So you're going to want that. You're going to want a ball of uh, of tip cleaner. It's actually built right in. It looks like this wire mesh stuff. I don't know if you can see that. That's to clean the tip of the iron. You're going to want some of that. All right. You might need a roll of enameled wire. Uh, this is used for jumping circuits. If your board is burned, this stuff is what you need to rebuild that board to, re to repair that trace. You may or may not need some of these. These are Murata 223S chokes or EMI filters. Um, in my case, we have one here that is damaged. And on my other board, we have one that is blown apart. Um, you can buy these. These are out of production, um, but they're still out there. Um, if you do a quick Google search, you can find people selling these on Amazon, eBay. Um, but the Murata 223S is what you want. Uh, that is what was on here originally. So I'm going to replace this one and maybe even this one. They both appear to have a little bit of corrosion damage to them. So yeah, actually, this one's really bad. Now, you're going to need some capacitors. So I went shopping. I bought these from Mauser. Um, these are the values of the original. Um, you do not need to go looking for automotive capacitors. Trust me on this. You don't need to go looking for automotive capacitors. It's just not even a thing. Um, I did some homework on this, and they came up with an automotive designation for capacitors because they were of higher temperature ratings, as I understand it. But all you need are 105C rated caps. That's it. 105C. That's what's on here. And they lasted this long. You're going to need some 47 microfarad, 63 volts. A 220 microfarad at 10 volts and a 33 microfarad at 35 volts. Those are the three caps that they used here. So let's replace one first. I'm gonna do the 220 10 volt. So we're gonna go ahead and flip our board around. Oh, there's one other tool you're gonna to want. Let me show you what I do usually. This makes it a little bit easier. Um, so what you wanna do is look at the capacitor that you're, you need to remove, okay? And then you wanna to try to line up the other side of it so you get the correct terminals here, and then you're going to mark them off with a magic or a, a permanent marker. That way you can flip the board and do your solder work just like that. You desolder de them from the back. So for this one over here, I'm going to look at the board from the side and just line it up like that. I'm going to mark off here. So we're going to take that one off. I'm going to go over here. Ah, there's that one. We're going to take that one off. Just mark them off real good. That way you don't desolder the wrong stuff. Then we're going to do our choke. It's over here. 
choke, filter, whatever you want to call it, whatever they want to call it, um, that's what it is. Okay. So you can desolder at home using desoldering braid or a solder sucker. I use both. Get your high, get your iron nice and hot, and we're gonna start desoldering. So I'm gonna take off this cap first. I'm gonna melt the solder here. Get it nice and toasty. Now back in the day, they used leaded solder. And you take your seat, your sucker tool, and you just do that. Okay, it didn't get very much solder out, so we might have to do a few other things here. I'm going to use the tip of the iron. I have a chisel tip on here, and I'm going to use that to help straighten out that pin once I get it up and, and, and melted. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go straight for my solder braid here. Put the tip and the on top of the braid, and the braid on top of the joint. And you're going to see it start to wick solder right up like that. Desoldering is a skill. It takes time to develop, and even if you're really good at it, sometimes it doesn't always work that well. So I'm going to go to the other joint here. So there's a few tricks that I have learned. Um, obviously, if you have a, um, a desoldering station, which I don't suggest you buy one for this one job, you don't need to, um, a desoldering station would make the job a lot easier, but I don't have one because they're so expensive that You know what? This isn't melting very well, is it? Must be a, a... I don't know what formula solder they use, but this is not melting. I'm at 600 degrees. It should be melting like butter. Alright. It's not wanting to melt. I might have to bump my temperature up a little bit. Let's do that. And because I have a digital soldering station, I can do that. I'm going to bump it up to 700 degrees, and I believe that's Fahrenheit on this one. So here we go. Oh, yeah, enter. Now, I will be offering, uh, once I've succeeded in rebuilding at least these two ECUs, I will start accepting um, customers. Um, so yes, um, well, I, I, I would love to take your money. I think you guys can do this on your own, but if you want, I will do it, but I won't be doing it for free. So, um, I, uh, I believe the rate I'm going to charge at this point is, um, I looked at some, some other services that do this, that offer this service. And they're charging about $180 at the minimum. Um, the one thing that I have kind of struggled with is I don't have a testing rig. So I can't test your ECUs. Um, but I can make these very basic repairs and then just send it back. And you would have to pay me whether it worked or not. Because there could be some other damage on your ECU that we don't know about. So, all right, once you've done that, what we can do is take your finger, put it on the, on the, on the end of the uh, capacitor you're trying to desolder, and you're going to rock that capacitor back and forth as you've got the iron tip on the joints that are affected. And what you're going to do is you're going to pull that capacitor out of its socket like so. Same with the other side. there yeah that's interesting how okay pull it right out interesting okay we got it out okay now this capacitor you can tell if they're leaking if you look at the um 
if you look at the um, the legs, the uh, the leads, <laughs> and you see a um, I, like a um, kind of a greenish or a grayish matte finish, like um, like it looks like a little bit of oxidization. That is a dead ringer for a leak. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and put the replacement capacitor in its place. So. We're looking for, what was it? A uh, 220 at 10 microfarad. So I bought enough of these capacitors to do several ECUs. So as I start to accept uh, clients, I will have enough to do the jobs for them too. So we're gonna put this part back in place here. I'm gonna do these one at a time just to keep things straight. Now the board is marked negative and the negative um, lead is the one with the stripe on every, that's universal for all capacitors. The stripe is the negative and the brown or the body colored is the positive. So you wanna line that stripe up with the negative marking, stick it through the board like that, and then split the leads apart to hold it in place. Then you take your soldering iron and your solder and you go ahead and just apply solder. You put the iron on the lead, between the lead and the solder pad, and that's gonna heat up both surfaces so that they both draw the solder into themselves. And that's it. That, that, that capacitor is replaced. Now that one wasn't leaking. Then you take your side cutters and you clip the leads. So just to recap, you need a soldering iron you're going to need a solder sucker. I use one of these. Um, these work pretty well. And you're going to need some side cut. Did I say side cutters? I think I did. Um, you, need, you need a soldering iron, at least a 40 watt. Um, the tip size should be something like this. Um, it's like a little chisel tip. And you're going to need, um, yeah, the solder braid, of course. So there's one. Then we're gonna do the next one. Okay, so I had to bump my heat up to 700 degrees because it was not, it was not taking it. Um, but look at how nicely, quickly that melted. Nice, nice. So I'm gonna heat up the pad. And I'm gonna suck the solder out. Now that one went pretty well. I think the higher heat helps. Let's do the next one. You want to let it sit there for a second or two. Because remember, that solder goes through the board all the way to the other side. So you want to make sure it's all getting melted evenly. Then we're going to take our solder wick and we're going to clean up those pads. Remove any residual. See what I'm doing? Clean them up nice. Then I'm going to go ahead and, uh, again, the trick that I, I've been using this trick for a long time, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty legitimate, but we're going to just rock the component a little bit to break that solder joint free and don't let it cure. Then what you can do is, as you get better at this, you can take the chisel tip of the iron and straighten the leads out a little better while you hold the heat up to it like this. Okay, now that one's ready to go. Pull it out. All right, and what do we got here? This one, no leakage at all. It's a 3335, so 3335. Um, there they are, I bought enough of these. When you're buying capacitors, I don't recommend, unless you have to, going on eBay. Um, or Amazon, I recommend going to an electronic supplier like DigiKey or Mauser. Um, that way you're getting them, you're, there's, no, there's no possibility or a very low possibility that you're going to get counterfeit or very low quality capacitors or mismarked capacitors. Um, when you're buying stuff from eBay or Amazon, you don't know what you're getting. That is a 
that is a real um unfortunately though in some cases you have to i could only get these uh from amazon and ebay so that was in and a few other brokers but you have to sometimes have an account with those brokers to get the parts so it's kind of a difficult proposition sometimes uh digikey and mauser they they will sell both to the industry and to the consumer you do not need an account with them they will sell to you even without one so there's two again those two capacitors now they are not currently leaking but they will eventually so we're addressing stuff before it fails in this case now the main capacitor that is the problem is going to be this big one the 47 micro at 63 volts and we're going to go ahead and rip that out now that is the one that takes these stupid things out almost every single time i did a couple of uh, searches for folks who've already done this repair and it turns out even the little guys can cause some serious damage so don't be fooled i can actually smell so electrolyte smells like fish when it heats up and that's what i smell right now yeah. when it gets hot it smells like dead fish it's gross but that's what it smells like so as we're heating these up that dead fish smell is starting to become more and more prevalent now this one did not did not suck through so we'll have to uh now if you damage a pad you have to fix it now there are many ways to do that but we'll take a look we'll if one of these ends up with a, with a little bit of damage we'll, we'll have to address the cause and fix that okay all right so that did not did not do a very good job so Let's try that again. I'm going to get it nice and hot. We don't want to roast the board, but I suggest if you're doing this yourself and you have a friend who does electronics repair, have them help you and guide you and maybe lend you tools to do the job right. That is such a nasty smell. All right. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we broke it free. Now it's important to allow the solder to cool while you're wiggling the component and that prevents it from re-adhering. Okay. Yeah, look at that. This guy was leaking profusely. No good. I'm going to clean these pads up because I want to inspect. So I'm going to take my solder braid and I'm going to go over the pads and kind of remove any residual solder. And I want to check for um, any damaged or burnt tracers. And to do that, I've got to remove the choke too. So we're going to heat that up and we're going to remove it as well. Okay. The rest of the capacitors on this board are either ceramic or tantalum. And they don't have the same problem that these electrolytics do. Electrolytic capacitors are available in higher capacities, which is why they're still used. Modern day electrolytic capacitors are what they call surface mount, and they require a different, different set of tools, a different technique to remove them safely. Um, you need a hot air station, which I do have here, um, but they're a little more, a little, a little different process uh, than it is. But they also do leak. Um, I don't have a, I, there's, there aren't any um, 
surface mount caps on these boards to show you what they look like. But um, the newer cars will have them, the older ones not so much. So I need to clean up the uh, solder pad here. Now, a lot of folks ask about the airbag modules, and it's the same process. But be careful. If you're doing an airbag module for a, uh, an early Miata, do realize that the boards are... Um, what I found in my, own ta in my own experience is that those boards are not um, built as well. As a matter of fact, they're pretty poorly made. And the, um, the holes aren't riveted through. So what's going to happen is, on those in particular... You're going to wind up um, damaging the board. Uh, the pads will, will rip off of them. Um, so, And no, I do not offer repairs on those for liability reasons. I've explained this to a couple of folks, and they were not happy, but they understand. Okay. So this is our choke. Goodbye, choke. So now we need to look at the board and kind of clean it up a little bit. Um, there's a lot of residue here. We're really looking for any burned pads. Um, let me try using some alcohol to clean this up. And uh, see how that see how that does. We just need to clean the board, clean any residual electrolyte off the board and make any repairs that we might find to the, um, oh yeah, that's pretty gross. And at the end of this, we're going to put it in the car and we're going to see if it starts. Okay. I think that's, that's only right, right? But it's important to remove any residual electrolyte, even if it looks dry, um, because that could, con could still continue to cause corrosion damage. This diode, D004, appears to be damaged. Um, I should be able to test that, though. Make sure it's not damaged. But we want to clean all this up. Before we start reassembly. Um, I'm going to take... I have a scratcher tool. And we're going to just make sure that uh, nothing is really eaten through. That's not what I'm looking for. It's over here. You can use, you know what, because I'm, I'm, I'm demonstrating this for the average, the average uh, DIY person. Yeah, I think we're good here. Nothing appears to be burned or broken or, or anything like that. So let's grab a... Um, what size was it again? It was a 4763 volt. I think it's in this bag here. And if you want to stick around, I'm going to do another one too. Just to roll over it again. All right. Remember, negative. Now, if your negative mark is missing, there's an easy way to tell which one's negative. And that's with using a multimeter with a tone function. The negative should connect to chassis ground. So whichever one of these Interestingly, it doesn't do that. That's interesting. Um, so center on that is negative. This should also connect to negative. But it strangely doesn't. Let's look at the other side. Yeah, it does. It's just on the back side of the board. Okay, that's what I was wondering. All right. Here we go. Negative to negative. Positive to positive. Drop that guy in there. And we're going to put the choke in as well since we're already there. Right. 
Now the choke, if you're not sure how it goes in, you're going to look at the Mickey Mouse ear pattern, and that helps guide you as to how it's oriented in the board. Uh, these are so old that the tape that holds on to the holds it to the to the strip is just hard to remove. I'm going to just trim the leads on this to make it easier to insert. There we go. There we are. Good as new. And we're going to spread those leads apart. So that it stays in position. I'm going to dial my temperature down to 600 degrees because I don't need it to be as hot as it is. Here we go. Just one leg at a time. So like I said, you know, anyone can do this job. If you're not familiar with soldering, if it's a new thing for you, and you don't want to practice on an ECU that may or may not be irreplaceable, <laughs> um, I suggest, my suggestion is to go online and look for a, uh, a solder, or um, they actually sell kits you can buy to build your own electronic gadgets. And they're great ways to learn how to solder. Get some practice with the iron, with some, if you have a more advanced iron like mine where you can change your heat settings for different applications but that would be a good way to learn how to solder and a company like adafruit.com a-d-a-f-r-u-i-t um, they specialize in that sort of stuff and that's what their whole business is about and you can just get yourself a basic soldering kit practice on building something and you'd still be ahead of the game after you buy all the tools and the parts it's still cheaper than sending it to somebody like me or to an EC repair shop. But you're done. That's that's it. That's all there is to it. We're, we are done. Um, you just need to put it back into its uh, shelf, put it in the car, and see if it runs. I'm pretty confident that it will. But um, maybe it goes in like this. Pretty simple stuff, guys. Anyone can do this. And once you do this job on your 90 to 97 or 2003, um, you will never have to do it again. I guarantee it. Um, this, these, these parts should last, oops, they should last at least, at least 20 years. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm being optimistic, but I feel that 20 years should be long enough. Um, by that point, by the end of 20 years, you're probably not going to own the car anymore, or you may not even be able to buy gas anymore at that point. The way things are going in the world, and you know, somebody who cares about the environment but also loves cars, it breaks my heart. But you know, the world is an ever-changing place. Hell, I may not even be alive in 20 years, so I won't care. <laughs> My point is, this should be a long-lasting repair. Now, someone asked about doing this in ceramic capacitors, which are uh, really not much more money, if not the same price. Uh, that might be difficult, as the capacitance on these parts is, is pretty high. Um, and you may not find a ceramic equivalent to some of these electrolytics. Now, I haven't really looked either. Um, now, if you were to do the job with ceramic capacitors, the ECU will outlive the car in the building that surrounds it. Yeah, pretty much. So, here's our bottom cover. Go on like this.
one of these screws was mangled by the previous owner. I bought this ECU um, really cheaply, knowing that I could fix it. Um, but yeah, I had to buy this ECU actually. So there's all that. And there's nothing else we need to do. We, we do need to put the top cover back on. We need to do some repairs that got dented. All right, I got the cover. And I only had three screws for this one. I don't know where the rest are. I do have the brackets, but I don't think he gave me the screws for those either. That's pretty much it. Um, when we put it in the car, though, we aren't going to... Whoa! Ah, damn, that was tight. When we put it in the car... Um... Damn, why is that so tight? Did he use an impact gun on that? Jeez. What was I saying? Well, that's my train of thought. Oh. There we are. We have to bolt it in um, because of the, the grounding of the chassis. So we have to bolt it in place um, very well. So we're going to do that. Let me compare this to my existing. Make sure I get the the right brackets in the right spot. We're just going to hold it in with one bolt, and that's it, just to test it. And what I want to do is I want to let the car get up to temperature and just make sure that everything is kosher in that, in that regard. Um, another thing I want to bring up, <coughs> you might be asking, well, what about water damage? Because water damage is a very real problem on these cars. They are convertibles, after all and the ECU is located in an area that's prone to water damage. Funny you should ask. Well, no, not really, but it's a good question to ask regardless. Um, so water damage is a more complicated repair, um, more difficult, maybe even impossible. Um, so you might be thinking, well, to prevent water damage, why don't I put RTB silicone or something on the cover? Don't do that. Um, actually, I'm going to rephrase that. You can do that. If you RTV silicone it for water intrusion protection, you can seal like a horseshoe this way, but do not seal the whole thing. Um, and the reason for that is these cars have a fairly rudimentary, um, altitude or, uh, atmospheric pressure sensor. And it's right here inside the box. In order for it to work, it needs to be exposed to atmospheric pressure. So if you were to seal the box up, and let's say you drove up a mountain, um, the car would not be able to compensate for the atmospheric pressure. Therefore, it won't run right. Um, so if you're going to do that, seal it around like a horseshoe. And I would just use regular RTV. And that should prevent water from pouring in from the top. If the car is in a flood, well, you're not gonna you're not gonna prevent damage. I mean, you've got bigger problems at that point. So um, anyway, so yeah, you can do that, and you should be okay. The factory didn't do it, probably for cost reasons. It just costs too much. So um, am I missing screws? I think I am. Oh. I guess he didn't give me all of them. Now these two screws, these go to something else. Oh, those are for... Where are those, Where are those go to? Certainly not this. So I, I think I got hosed. I didn't get all the screws. So, well that happened. I, whatever. Alright, so what we're going to do is... Um, we're going to pop this into my car. Oh, you know what I could do? I'll just take a screw from the, the, the big mount there. And we'll just mount the other bracket to the other side that way. I 
of this going on again? Like that. Yeah, just like that. All right, so let's go out to the garage. Now it's important um, that you disconnect your battery first. I should have said that in the beginning of the video, but I thought that was obvious. Do not unplug this with the battery connected. That would be a mistake. Don't do that. So we're going to get this into my car, fire it up, and see what happens. Okay, so I got the ECU mounted with one bolt. Now this one came out of a car with an automatic transmission. Um, I wasn't sure if that would be a problem or not until I looked at the part number. It's the same part number that was in my manual. And um, I looked inside and they have the same uh, EEPROM version. It's written on the EEPROM chip. So there should be no difference between the two. So I've got to hook up my battery and then we'll know whether or not we succeeded. All right, so I got the, uh, the garage door open. Let's see what's gonna happen. car hasn't been started since September. It's now January. January 20th. Okay. Now the ECU has it. There's, there's an idle learning procedure, I believe. It's idling nice. So we're gonna let it run until it warms up. I got no engine light. Okay, it doesn't like it. It was at this moment that I realized something was very wrong. Um, the idle started randomly jumping. It did it twice during this test run, and um, the idle would just jump all over the place. Um, and the truth is, the ECU that I just worked on, um, I have no history on it. I don't know what other issues it might have had. Um, but we did the procedure correctly. We replaced the defective components, and we didn't do anything else to the ECU. Um, so I decided to, I ran the car for a little bit longer. It ran fine. It idled it, but then it would randomly blip out. So there is clearly something very wrong with that ECU. Um, and if I recall, it wasn't even compensating for engine load. Like I turned the AC on and it wasn't compensating for that extra load. It's supposed to boost the idle speed. And when you manipulate the steering wheel back and forth, it should also bump the idle up a little bit. Um, so again, this, this ECU came from a car with unknown history. Um, I hadn't tested it beforehand. So I think what we're going to do here is we're just going to go straight to the factory ECU for my car, and we're going to make the repairs on that one instead. Um, so let's just go ahead and cut to that part now. So slightly, it's not a normal Phillips head screw, so you got to be real careful if, unless you have a JIS screwdriver. All right, so let's mark off our air. I'm going to leave it in the shell. I think I can do that. I'm going to mark off the areas that we need to uh, pay attention to. All right, and we're going to test this. And we're going to put it in the car. It's it's already warmed up. So I don't know how that's going to affect it, but um, I'm actually kind of curious to be honest with you. How is that going to affect the results that we get? You put an ECU into a car that's already warm, what's going to happen? It's not going to know what's up. So the damage level on this one is a little more, a little bit more, a little bit more extensive than that other one. 
So it'll be interesting to see how this one responds to treatment. Well, like I said, I mean, I'm not going to write off this procedure for that. I mean, it did run the car okay, but that weird idle problem, that's, that's nothing to ignore either. It could be unrelated. It could be a lot of things. Could be a lot of things causing that. So. My job here is to figure out whether or not whether or not there's a problem with that ECU that I didn't know about. Um, but it, again, it could be could be a lot of things, you know. So I haven't really decided whether or not I'm going to tackle these as a business. Um, like I said, I have to test this out. I have to know for sure that this is something that I can that I can reliably fix. And the nature of the problem is very simple. Um, you've got a series of components that have a very high failure rate. They're easy to replace, and they by right should be replaced. Um, before they cause any board damage. I'm afraid that for most 90s cars of this of the early 90s vintage have already been damaged. Um, well, the boards have been damaged to the point where, you know, this repair may not be viable. I mean, look at this thing. Just split apart, just like that, to nothing. And, yeah, that's not great. <laughs> not supposed to be that way man that's not good Let me get myself in frame here my suggestion is if you've got the money and you care about the car you care about keeping it on the road you know pay the hundred and 80 bucks or so. I found a shop that does it for a buck 80 and just have them have them do the job and they have the testing rigs to do all the necessary making sure that it's 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 a viable ECU first of all and uh, making sure that uh, the repair holds up. Because if I do this job, I'm going to charge you for my time, but ultimately, you know, if you send it to me, I'm going to charge you whether it fixes it or not, and I'm not going to test it because I'm not going to sacrifice my personal vehicle for somebody else's ECU, if that makes any sense at all. Now, what has me concerned is, okay, so there's... There's nothing there. I see a lot of a lot of burning. See this right here. This is burned. Um, this is burned right here. So what happens is you've got electrolyte flowing downward, and it's shorting ground to positive, and it's burning the um, the board over time. But it's okay because well, it really isn't okay uh, because the um, There's no land, uh, maybe there was, was there? Yeah, that's got me a little worried here because that looks severely damaged. This trace right here at that it just ate right around it and the one on the other side that is supposed to link okay so I'm gonna need this we need to make sure that um, 
this is a there's a viable connection between this pin and here. It looks like there is. Not a very good one though. There's not a lot of metal left there. So I may end up, that's not good. Yeah, that's not good. Now the other ECU, did I put the cover back on? Yeah, I did. Um, uh -huh. Now this one in the middle is ground, but there's nothing left there. Okay, there's enough. And the third one in is on the other side of the board. Yeah, and that's okay. But what has me worried is this pad here. Okay, it'll be fine. All right, I, have, I was a little concerned, but I don't think I have to be. The connection is still being made. But you see the, the importance of, of fixing this early because if it were to be left, if I were to have just ignored the problem, like a lot of folks are going to do, the damage will just continue to burn and burn and burn until there's until it until the engine dies. And a proper diagnosis links it to the ECU, and then you have to then figure out, all right, well, where am I going to get a good ECU? Mazda doesn't sell these anymore, my friends. <laughs> And the junkyards, well, I guess it shouldn't be that hard to get to. I mean, but they're going to charge for them. And there are no returns. If it doesn't work, you're shit out of luck. Ooh, that hurt. All right. Let's do the capacitor. proper ECU shop will have the necessary equipment, wiring harnesses and everything else, to properly test the ECU for functionality. And that's something that I cannot provide. All I can do is what you see here, where we just make the repair. And the parts that I'm putting in are good. so. That little idle problem that we had just a second ago, um, that is not something that I can diagnose. We don't know what caused it. We just don't know. Um, Oh, I desoldered the wrong leg. I desoldered a diode. Ah, whoops. I marked it wrong. Shit happens. So, that's all fixed. All this is repaired. Bada boom, bada bing. Alright, let's put it in the car and see what happens. Okay, original ECU is back installed. All right, let's hook up the battery. Here we go. Now, the last one, we had a bit of an idle conundrum. Don't know why. Let's see what happens. I don't know if I have to do this or not, but... Pretty textbook startup for this car. It is warm. 
idle settles down. I'm gonna let the temperature catch up before I start revving it. It's still a dead cold engine though. I think we have heat though. Eh, not much. Yeah, it's still very cold. Running smooth. But that other ECU, I think it had another problem that was not known. Um, so there could be further damage done to that ECU that was unrelated to what we did. Could have been caused by what what had transpired, the, the, the leakage and everything else. It revs nicely. Real nice. Very responsive. So we're getting good, clean power to that ECU now for the first time in how, God knows how long. Um, but I do want to let the temperature get up. I want to let it, let it run for a little bit. It's running good though. Got a little bit of heat, but that temperature is still dead cold. So let's give it some time. Okay, the temperature needle's starting to pick up, so that's good. See, you want to look for stuff like that when you're doing work to an ECU because you want to make sure that, that that is reported, I believe, by the ECU. There are two temperature sensors, and it depends on the model year, but some of them are receiving the, uh, the dash readout from the ECU. Some of them are directly from the sensor, so you want to make sure that it's as it warms up, it starts to compensate by changing the fuel mixture a little bit. It's supposed to lean itself out as it warms up. And it seems to be okay. I'm getting a strong exhaust odor from the catalytic converter, but that's normal. Um, that's 100% normal. Um, especially again, it's probably 30 degrees outside right now. And this car doesn't typically see those temperatures but it's very responsive and idling fine, totally fine. Now the problem that I had with the idle dropping and getting all weird um, when it was hot, it could take all summer to know for sure that that was indeed fixed. Now, another thing, make sure that it compensates for engine load and it does. Look at that. So the, as I turn the wheel, the pressure sensor on the um, on the power steering pump sends a signal to the ECU to boost idle. Now it's too cold to run the AC. It won't do anything, watch. Oh, there it goes, and it's compensating. So that's all working fine. I'm not saying it runs better than it did before because that's a, that would be a load of shit uh, because it ran great before. Um, and that typical idle wander on a car that's 30 years old is pretty typical. Um, it's not really wandering too much. It never really did. It's about normal. So let's, let's start it back up again. This thing is loud. Lights right off. That other ECU, there was something wrong with it. Beyond what we fixed. So I, I, I'm... That other one, it, it ran a little funny, too. Um, and I started to notice that the longer I, uh, I messed with it. So it would, it would just randomly shoot the idle up to the moon, and then it would drop, and then it would go up and up and down. So that, that thing had a problem, and, and it's hard to say what it was. Um, that one I would probably send to a shop and have them fix it. It's almost worth doing just to have a spare ECU. Um... But I think I'm confident that this repair was a good one and it was worthwhile. And I'm gonna button this thing up tonight. Put it back together, put it back to sleep. And then we're gonna go have some fun in the springtime. So, yeah, I think that's gonna conclude our video. Um, again, if you guys wanna send me your ECUs, um, you know, drop a comment below. I'll do the repairs, I'll do it you know, for under a hundred bucks. It'll be under a hundred dollars. 
I'll do the repairs, send it back, you know, and we'll, um, we'll go from there, I guess. So that's going to conclude our video. Thank you for watching.